Well, I'm Peter Gow. I'm the Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse. And with us today is Perry Hewitt. And I will do the full disclosure. I got to know Perry Hewitt when I was her son's college counselor when I was working in a school, a brick and mortar school. Uh, and what I knew about Perry at that point was that she seemed to A, know everybody, uh, B, have really interesting and creative thoughts on lots of things. And at that point, she was the chief digital officer at Harvard, which just sounded like a really cool title. And uh, Perry describes herself, I think, as a, a digital strategist, a marketing, well, she might, might, not, might not say guru, but we will. And so we've asked Perry to come and talk to us today about how schools should be communicating what's going on as we navigate this summer of COVID and a pretty murky future as far as how and when schools are going to start. So with that, I think I'll just turn this over to Perry. Perry, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Sarah. Hello from the murky present here in New York City, where we're just starting to reemerge and excited to be doing it. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about the four principles, I think, are sort of timing, clarity, consistency, and trust that should be the underpinning of a communication strategy. Uh, if you could advance the slide. So I sort of make my bread at the intersection of all these things, digital strategy, marketing communications, and product development. Thinking about digital products, what are the ways that people interact with your organization? A digital product could be your LMS system, it could be your website, it could be your campus app. I've been lucky to work at the intersection of education, arts, and philanthropy for a lot of my career. I've been academia adjacent, which has been a privilege, and do a little bit of private sector work as well. And that's our masked reality today in Central Park. Next. So what's the environment in which you're sending your communications? I think having, I'm a product of independent schools, whether or not they'd admit to it, having sent my son to independent schools, I think there's so much excellence, rigor, engagement. I mean, the faculty they haven't gone to a boarding school. These are faculty who live, work, teach, coach. I mean, they're, they're absolutely involved. That it's really easy to lose sight of how your families are you know, interacting with the world and what is their news cycle that they're dealing with. Obviously, it's 24 seven now. There's no more sort of sending a press release at 4 p.m. on Friday with bad news. It's, you know, it's gonna endure and be shared. Um, you know, there's constant headlines and mixed messages, right? The communications around what's the best learning approach, masks, no masks, gloves, no gloves, is all very confusing right now because we're in the midst of a crisis. Uh, there's significant mistrust in institutions and expertise. And if you're interested, Richard Edelman um, does an annual trust survey that comes out around the time of WEF, which is in January. And there's some really interesting findings around how organizational trust is eroding and individual trust is rising for good and ill in social media. But uh, something to think about that, you know, your institutional brand may not be automatically trusted the way it once was pandemic has obviously shut us down in really significant ways and people are pondering the reopening and the economy is causing families to scrutinize all spending and there are a lot of contradictory findings around what that means for you know independent schools and colleges universities next so these are just examples of some of the headlines i pulled out but i've been watching doing a little bit of work in k-12 now so what are, you know, what are families thinking about? Do you want to hold your spot? Do you want to give up your spot? Is online just the same as online at your public school? So why am I paying? Or is online just differentiated? To what extent is the promise and value that I entered into a relationship with an independent school for, or that I'm considering a relationship with an independent school for, going to be alive and well in what we think may be a one to two year COVID era of in school, out of school? Next. So the plus side is, you know, parents have seen the rubber meet the road, right? They've seen the incredibly hard work that all of you do with their students. So I think whether it's teaching your six-year-old or tolerating your 16-year-old, uh, I think that this is one area we can all acknowledge you have an advantage. People see how hard the actual teaching is. Next. Um, your challenge now is communicating facts, assuaging concerns, and fostering connection. And I think often it's very easy to get very embroiled in, in number one only. Like we need to know because you're knowledge-based people. You're smart, engaged, intelligent people who are, want to focus on 
what the absolute truth is about safety, about our reopening plans, about you know how many dorm rooms, all those facts. But a lot of the other work you have to do is the soft work of how do we assuage the concerns and how do we foster connection? And guess what? We have to do it all through this terrible you know, Zoom medium. So those things are a lot harder to do when you're not bringing parents or families together around breakfast to talk about things. Next. Um, so point one, timing. You know, I think you really need to think about what's the news cycle, what are the social media conversations, and what are the regular communications expectations people have to avoid sort of a groundswell response. I've seen organizations go into all day meetings about issue X and not realize that the social media conversation about issue X has been broiling the entire day. Then they come out with this perfectly crafted black box statement and guess what? It's totally it has to be thrown out. because They've lost attention to what where the conversation was. I think there's a lot of fear in elite and organizations full of smart people that to, if you have an early message, it's useless conjecture, right? Like we need to wait till we have the facts. We need to know what's going on and tell people. And I think there's a need to keep people, because remember those headlines before, they're hearing, you know, what might be happening in K-12. So they want to know, you know, how you're thinking about this without all the facts all the time. I think building a regular cadence of expectations, uh, or cadence of communication can help create expectations and prevent that firestorm on a Tuesday if they know every Friday they're going to get Friday musings or, you know, our Monday update. It can prevent a lot of the churn and the agita if they know when people are, when you're going to communicate with them. And I think it's always important to think in terms of timing, not only what you're communicating when, but who you're communicating to when. Just thinking about concentric circles, never want to be in a situation where you know, your faculty, your trustees are hearing at a different time than others. So really making sure you get those concentric circles right. Next. Uh, clarity. So there's a little bit of marketing speak, so bear with me. You know, the idea of your brand is your unique and enduring promise of value. You know what it represents and what you are promising to those who engage with it. And they are differentiated from school to school. The promise is different. Your messages are the ideas that underpin your communications. You know, what are the three or four things we're reinforcing that we say, yep, an education at X is still worth paying for, being involved with, dedicating our resources to during this COVID era because these core messages, these three things about our learning, our learning always has you know, a one-to-one, -one, or our learning always has language first, or whatever the core principles are of your organization, Defining those is so important because that's what's going to need to be reinforced throughout the entire communications uh, time frame. Um, and a great message reflects your audience perspective. Again, it isn't about like what we want people to think about our institution. It's what what is you know what people already think and how that interplays with what we want them to know. Being credible, memorable, plain language. I mean, no more holistic, please. I've road tested that word in eight different organizations. Nobody likes it. Um, and inspire sharing and repetition. Next. Um, so again, your messages have to be grounded in your North Star educational philosophy. You might have, you know, Bill George has written a lot about North Star if you're interested in this, but faculty administrators have to be aligned. Well, how this rolls out can differ. The essential underpinning of we believe our education is important if X, Y, and Z cannot differ from organization to organization. And I think what's undertold is sort of communicating roles and responsibilities within and beyond school walls. I knew the kind of independent school I went to, you know, K-8, you know, the parent's job was to drop off and pick up and not ask any damn questions. That was it. You know, how has that changed for your organization, for time, for Zoom in the living room? Give parents a job to do so they do not, for the love of goodness, come up with one themselves. What should faculty count on for families? And increasingly, there's pressure on you know, schools to show what, what norms will faculty provide? What are the regular, you know, touch points that we can all count on that faculty will provide students during this time? This is not to say faculty autonomy is very important, but consistency is also important. So finding that balance is critical. Next. Um, again, consistency, validate the North Star with current examples. You know, you can talk about student projects, faculty perspectives, and again, like, it, you've got a little room for wet cement here. It doesn't have to be a peer reviewed, faculty driven paper on the 19 things I learned. What are they observing during this time um, in ways that if we're trying to teach with value X, 
how is this playing out? What are three things we tried in the classroom to do this? And maybe one that didn't work. And then third party research findings where you have them to validate the, the North Star, not the individual examples. I think it's important to ensure digital and print collateral are aligned. And I think this is really boring stuff, but I think you do have to conduct a content audit to cull out of date information. Everybody loves to create new stuff. Nobody likes to wade through their old stuff and see what's totally not true. And I think now more than ever, people are thirsty for information. You want to make sure you're doing anonymized Google searches on your site to make sure that PDF on uh, educational philosophy from 2003 is not still out there. Next. Uh, trust. So I think if you have done the North Star right, if you've really said this is our unique and enduring promise of value, this is how it plays out in the educational, in our educational principles, I think they can see you sweat a little. I think this isn't easy. I think it's okay to see the sausage being made as long as people know that you have a, a course you are steering toward, it's okay to acknowledge deviations or mishaps along the way. I think you can admit what you don't or can't know and how you will get that and communicate that information. Um, I think a lot of schools are very wedded into, you know, here's the view book, it's pretty, here are the students, it's all a told story. I think it's important to say sometimes you're not going to know in situations like these because it buys you authenticity and credibility. I think empowering different trusted messengers, I don't know whether you have multiple principals and a headmaster, or trustees you can use, or faculty who've been with the institution for a really long time, but think about different messengers for different messages and how they can be deployed in your communications. And finally, focus on content over production values. I think people get so wedded to beautifully polished video or well-edited audio. I think those things are important for, you know, your close-up campaign communication or certain communications, but in general, people want to know. And ironically, the less polished you are, the more credible you are. Next. Um, this is just a quote. It was about Lawrenceville and CNN, a bit of a sort of puff opinion piece. But I, I really like the, the points that were written here. It's this idea of, you know, Effort, thought, integrity, and effort, I think, is important to call out. People could see it was hard, and people worked really hard on it. Um, and the idea that the school communicated well in the crisis because those things were visible to the families they were communicating with. Next. So to summarize, understand the speed of your audience, and what's you know, the communications they're interacting with, Build your own cadence of communication, and why not share that plan as much as you can internally? I think, again, there's a tendency for different departments in any organization to get siloed and focused. You're trying to do the job, not to invite third-party comment on everything. But is there a way you can promote internal transparency so people know what's coming a little bit? Align around your North Star educationally. And from that North Star, you develop that set of credible messages that resonate and really try to use those as an underpinning of your communications. That's what you hold up to each communication and say, are we reinforcing one or more of the messages we think are most important? Because there are a million great things you could say about all your institutions, but are we focused on the right one? I think, think beyond the PDF. What are the ways you can authentically and have interactive communication with people? It's risky. It's scary. It's much easier to just put out a polished video than engage in conversation with audiences that can be tough. But I think you win a lot more by opening up that door. And I think you iterate and repeat with your communications. We, we don't know what 2020 is going to look like for the rest of it. We don't know what 2021 is going to look like for the rest of it. As long as you're building from your framework, aligning with your North Star, I think you continue to iterate and learn about the mechanisms that work best for communicating with your important stakeholders. Thank you. Wow, Perry, thank you so much. And, and you said so many things that, uh, that make so much sense. And I, a couple of phrases stick out for me, the idea of that promise and value. I think independent schools at this point are so sometimes buried in, uh, buried in the craziness and the, the worry of the time that they don't necessarily uh, hold on to the idea of what that promise and value is and you know in the work we're doing with schools and and with teachers where we keep talking about that north star that this is your mission and your values and this is what you believe and you have to to build everything you do around that uh, also struck by the terms churn and agita which i um, don't even want to think about but i think we're all very familiar with what those mean um 
couple of questions. Oh, sorry. I've got a couple of questions that came in as well. Um, they came in sort of as ones that folks wanted to ask anonymously, but Peter, you mentioned the North Star as well. And Perry, will you say the name again of who's done more work and maybe give sort of the one sentence encapsulation and then I'll share that link. I'll find the so Bill Joel you mentioned. is a professor at Harvard Business School uh, who's written about North Star. And it may also be in Jim Collins' Good Great. He may have alluded to it there as well, but those are two books I think that are relevant to this kind of messaging. And I would say that the North Star is where you feel you, you are driven to achieve in your mission and how that delivers value to your audiences, right? That's the, that's the core thing you are trying to do. I think the challenge with independent schools is that they're trying to do a thousand things which, and they need to do a thousand things but what is the thing that's uniquely you right are you unique for your language learning are you unique for the whole child education you know with are you unique because you use a Montessori method I don't know what makes you unique but focusing on that as your north star and using that to align around can be very helpful in terms of decision making and of course, for so many independent schools, what they, they think of as the unique part of what they do is the relationships that are built between uh, students and teachers, families in the school. And those relationships are each of them unique. Uh, we like to think it's an industry-wide thing that happens. And again, uh, all of that you're suggesting are ways for schools to keep open those channels of communication that are the basis of great relationships that you know we talk about you know academic things that schools can do to, to reduce friction between uh, the friction in the process of learning and you're talking about you know reducing friction in the process of, of communicating the really important things that are going on at the school also acknowledging that different schools have different flavors of what that looks like. Yes. Some are more formal, some are more casual. So don't try, you know, uh, don't try to wear mom jeans, right? No. You know, <laughs> put on, put on a I, I never do. <laughs> so that actually leads into another question. It's a two-parter. And the second part is a little bit of a zinger. So whoever asked it, you know this is coming. Um, one, so the first part is, could you tell a little bit more about communication that reflects the audience's perspective? So I think it's sometimes organizations will communicate what they want to believe about, like working with the prominent foundation. We want you to know us for these four important elements of what we do. Or, and we don't want you to call it uh, climate change. We want you to call it weather, uh, you know, rigidity under, you know, frigidity, whatever it is. They, they build their own language and their own terminology. Um, so often both the message and the language are so from the institution's perspective of like, you're trying to change the world to get them to adopt this language and to understand the world in a new way. And I think there are times when understand the audience perspective Another piece of audience perspective is, uh, it's worth looking at Clayton Christensen's The Job to Be Done. What is the job to be done of an independent school? Is the milkshake story of, you know, the job to be done, the milkshake, mm -hmm. keep your mouth busy, to keep your stomach full, all these things. Um, so what are families looking for an independent school to do and to acknowledge that in your communications? You would love to say it's all about whole child enrichment and learning. For some parents, it's about college. For some parents, it's about childcare. Okay, so the, the zinger of the follow-up to that is, what about a politically divided community where illness and politics and um, measures taken seem to be really charged? How would you advise schools um, besides being really careful, I guess? Oh, we froze for a second. Barry, Barry's frozen here. For I mean, a I... I in the spring where, um, where uh, you know, large events were being canceled, some of which I was working with organizations put a ton of money in, and the organization wasn't going to cancel because they were waiting for the government to say they had to cancel because then your insurance kicks it, you know, and the optics are totally different if a third party makes you cancel. So I think the same way, you want to point to that third party all the time, the most credible 
you know, research. Not everyone will agree with you, but if you can say it's the law, it's the authority we've all agreed to consult, it makes it easier, but it's hard. Okay. So we another. have a, another. Oh, yep, Peter, you asked this one. I'm monopolizing. <laughs> sure. Uh, th this is a, 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 a tricky question because it gets into some some conversations that we in independent schools, uh, I think, tend to shy away from. Uh, and the question is, uh, we've heard from families that don't wish to enroll if we remain in distance learning. Uh, see it as a case where maybe our value is a little lower than it was in that case, but the public school value is perhaps halved. And this gets into sort of the, the judgment thing and the calls that we were uncomfortable making sometimes. So in a sense, we should have a greater relative value. How do you suggest we address that? I would say, if at all. If the state slashes budgets and overcrowding increases, how directly should we reference that? I think it's, it's risky territory to directly reference, you know, what, what is, you know, uniformly seen as a social ill, you know, as a value proposition. But I think to underscore the differentiated things, if the headline says 32 kids, you know, one computer, no access, you know, you don't say, look, look over there, you say, you know, here's where we're doubling down. We're gonna have four kids, everyone's got a computer, everyone's got, you know, really focus on the things that are, that you can provide that others can. And I do, you know, I, I do hear that, you know, I spend far too much time on TikTok and there are a lot of online Harvard memes that are pretty funny. Like, you know, we're all in online school, what's the difference? But I think there is a legitimate difference. And what you, you know, what you do as an event schools is foster those relationships. So the more you can tell that relationship story in addition to the academic story, not only are they going to teach Tim Spanish, but Tim's gonna build relationships with an English teacher and a college counselor that will change his life. And we're gonna approximate that as best we can, not ideally, but as best we can online for the day we can go back to the school that will keep up. There's also, you could also allude to sunk cost benefit. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's some language you could do about that that, again, doesn't point to misfortunes elsewhere, but says, you know, like, you, we, we don't want to, you know, any, any subscription service you've tried to cancel from Netflix to anything else will we'll make this case to you. So what are the ways that you've already spent the money and you, you want those relationships to continue to accrue over time? That's good. So fo focus on your positives and stay away from the invidious comparisons. Right. That's right. Okay. I'm going to sort of name the, the biggest elephant in most rooms right now because I've been maintaining and I have yet to feel as though anybody's come back with a, with a better uh, response than, than what I'm thinking right now, that at this point on planet Earth on June 24th or whatever it is, there's not a single school anywhere I think really and truly on planet Earth that can say with complete confidence what its opening plan is for the coming school year. Um, and there may be places who believe very strongly, but who can say this with a with a 1000% degree of confidence. How do schools, I mean, can you expand a little bit on kind of what you were saying about how schools communicate yeah, right now we don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I think, you know, aligning around, we make decisions about acceptable risk every day. I accept that when I walk across the street here, a car will not blow through a red light. If I get in to drive a car, which, you know, is never a good idea, you know, we accept that there's a risk that we will take. So I think the message should be around, we are, we are in the business of gauging with incomplete information, acceptable risk. But I think to deny risk really costs you credibility. We can guarantee you you're good in this bubble. It's set hallways one way, we're good to go. I think the more you can say, we are you know, working with the best third party and, you know, sources like the CDC or whatever your local state government provides you, um, these great educational leaders, we are, you, we are gauging acceptable risk and in our judgment, and I think also showing what is your plan when it all goes wrong, when the English teacher and the coach test positive. I think, I think it's really important not to pretend you can prevent that from happening. You know, I don't think you need to have every detail of that plan outlined to your families, but I think it's very real to say, you know, and we accept in this world of acceptable risk, there, there may be, you know, breaches and issues, and we have, you know, the following three protocols in place, which we will communicate to you as needed for if and when these things occur. Because I think that makes you seem prepared 
real and research informed. That is great advice. I heard Megan Mann yesterday on the NAIS legal briefing say one of the things that schools need to understand is that if you open and you have folks on campus, somebody will get COVID on your campus and they will come to campus with it. And she said, you need to know that opening and plan accordingly. And I think you just really eliminated that as well. I'm on the board of trustees of our private social club and we're absolutely communicating the same thing because people keep saying, is it safe? You know, I'm never going to put out a message that says, yep, it's safe. We're good to go. We have taken every available precaution with the best knowledge that we have and have protocols for remediation. And we, we believe that the risk level is acceptable and we welcome you back. And I think that independent school differentiator is this is what we consider the risk and it's acceptable. And then you decide for your family and we will find ways to work with you. Um, sort of the flip side of the family that won't, won't stay enrolled if their um, child is in the online learning. I think we also have the opportunity to provide online learning when families aren't ready to come back to school because of their risk accept acceptance. The thing is just not to ever have to say, oh gosh, we hadn't thought of that keep your planning as up to the moment as you possibly can and, and let people know that's how you're, how you're approaching this. So oh, we I, are at the end of our time. Oh, Peter, I cut you off. I was no going to ask. Do you no. <laughs> We're at the end of our time. Um, Perry, is there any sort of final, final thought that you'd like to send everybody off uh, the content on it, I think is something that needs to go on everybody's to-do list. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thanks for everything you do. Independent schools have shaped my and my family's lives and it's heroic work and I'm very grateful. And second of all, I would say great is the enemy of good. You do what you do because you're passionate, you're smart, you're engaged. Um, realize that, you, that we live in an imperfect world of imperfect answers and the more you be both prepared and data informed, but also acknowledge that in your communication, the more credible and persuasive you will be. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. And also, what, before we go, one, one last thing, uh, perryhewitt.com if you're uh, interested in learning more. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And yes, we're recording. Thanks all.